Um, good morning, welcome for like the fifth time. We're so glad that you guys are here. Welcome to the family. You just gotta say something, right? Not dive right into it. <clears throat> um, so this morning, we're gonna continue with the story of Joseph. And while you're turning in your Bibles to Genesis 44, that's where we're gonna pick up. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a quick recap because I figured we'd have some visitors after Easter Sunday. So Joseph is this guy at 17 years old. He's betrayed by his brothers out of jealousy because he was the favorite son of his father and the son of his father's favorite wife, Rachel. His brothers hated him for it, and he's sold into slavery. He's slandered by his master's wife in slavery and then thrown in prison. In prison, he's abandoned by his friends and left to rot. Thirteen years of his life, he's known only betrayal and abandonment and trauma. And through it all, he incredibly manages to maintain his integrity. That's kind of phase one of Joseph's life. After rotting in prison, in a royal prison for several years, God raises him out of it, and he goes from prisoner to viceroy of Egypt in a single day, after interpreting dreams for Pharaoh. After all the pain he'd been through, the text says he had hoped to forget his past. He had hoped to forget his past, his brother's betrayal, and move on in his new life. But seven years later, his brothers unexpectedly show up at the door. There's a famine. Remember, Joseph interpreted the dreams, and Joseph said there's going to be a famine in, in, in all the land. Seven years of plenty are followed by seven years of famine, and when the famine starts, his brothers show up needing food. Joseph reels <clears throat> in pain as memories he had tried to forget are ripped up to the surface. More than once, the text says he turned away and wept. Incredibly, we saw Joseph refuse to use his position of authority to hurt his brothers, his brothers who betrayed him. And by so doing, he stood in the gap of years of abuse and mistreatment and generations of dysfunction in his family. That's what we talked about two weeks ago. He was on the receiving end of it almost his whole life, but he didn't perpetuate it. <clears throat> Instead of punishing the brothers, Joseph had a big enough view of God and his purposes to ask the question, thank you, have they changed? Have they changed? Have my brothers changed? This gang of 10 brothers who had sold him, their own brother, to a slow death sentence for easy cash, 20 silver coins. He wanted to know if they were different. And so he schemes a plan. He puts them through some tests that bring up all sorts of guilt in the brothers, and they conclude that they're being punished by God for betraying Joseph. Remember, they don't know it's Joseph. Guilt and paranoia govern them. We saw that too. And they expected betrayal at every turn. Ultimately, Joseph forces them to bring Benjamin, his only full brother. Benjamin was the new favorite son of Jacob, born of his favorite wife, Rachel. Remember the favoritism of Jacob. And Benjamin replaced Joseph the, as the old, the old favorite son after Jacob was told that Joseph was dead. And Joseph intends to see, this is the point of it all, he wants to see if they'll betray Benjamin like they betrayed him. <clears throat> and upon Benjamin's arrival, Joseph throws an extravagant feast. It says, again, when he saw his brother, his full brother, who he hadn't seen in 13 years, he weeps. And he throws a feast, and, that, and then that is where we left Joseph and his brothers two weeks ago. They're feasting with their brother that they think is dead. And they're feasting and drinking freely together. But Joseph that has a little intentionality in the meal. And he marked out Benjamin with a portion five times larger than the other brothers. Remember, he wants to recreate that favoritism. And he wants to see if they'll respond to favoritism toward Benjamin with the same hatred that they had shown him when he had his fancy clothes way back in chapter 37. Would they betray Benjamin as they had him? But the five times portion was only the beginning of the test. And that was where we left off. And now we're going to pick up in chapter 44 in verse 1. It says this. So they've eaten, they've drank freely, which means, you know, they, they got drunk. And then he commanded his house steward saying, fill them in sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money 
in the mouth of his sack. Okay, we've seen this before. This was what caused the gang of ten to freak out the first time. They got their money back. They're like, they're going to think that we stole it. They're freaking out. But he gives another instruction. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his money for the grain. So Joseph moves to part B of his plan to mark out Benjamin. Benjamin was the youngest. First, it was a portion five times larger at the feast, but now he's going to mark Benjamin as the one who has done something wrong, stolen something, and therefore deserving punishment. Benjamin is the surrogate for Joseph in the test. He's the representative of Joseph to the gang of ten brothers, and Joseph wants to see what they'll do this second time around. Are they going to abandon him? Like they ab- are they going to abandon Benjamin like they abandoned Joseph? Put the silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest. And so the steward does so. Verse 3, as soon, it was, as soon as it was light, um, as soon as it was light, the men were sent away, they with their donkeys. It's also the second time, I forgot to mention, the silver cup. This is the second time that we've seen silver in the sacks of the gang of ten. And I don't think I mentioned it two weeks ago, but this is very intentional. Remember, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Silver. And that's why upon discovering the silver the first time in chapter 42, the brothers are dismayed and they say immediately, God is punishing us. Now we have more silver being put right in front of them. More silver being put right in front of them. The pain of Joseph's betrayal has not lessened over the years. He wants them to remember what they did to him, as well as see if they'll do it different a second time around with Benjamin. He wants them to remember this is intentional. Remember what happened, and now let's see what you do the next time around. So as soon as it was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. Remember, they were worried about their donkeys last time. They're safe and sound. Joseph didn't steal them. They had just gone out of the city and were not far off when Joseph said to his house steward, up, follow them in, go get them. And when you overtake them, say, why have you repaid evil for good? Is this not the one from which my Lord drinks and which he indeed uses for divination? You have done wrong in this. So the servant gets up, overtakes them, and he says exactly that. And then the brothers respond. Verse 7, why does my Lord speak, speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Well, you guys give another good account of yourselves. But whatever, I'm sure you're scared senseless at this point to pull anything like that. Verse 8, behold, the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks, we have brought back to you. Remember the first time we put silver in the sacks and they're like, we got to bring this back and pay them double so that they think we didn't steal it. Remember, we brought the money back from Canaan. Why would we steal silver and gold from, our Lord's, from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found. With whomever of your servants it is found, let him And we also will be my Lord's slaves. They're putting their honor on the block as collateral. It's common in shame-based cultures. But you didn't want to say that. You didn't want to say that because we know who has the cup. They don't. We know who has the cup. The plot thickens. They just gave Benjamin a death sentence with their own lips. Whoever of your servants it is found, let him die. So he said, now let it also be according to your words. The, the steward responds back, he with whom it is found shall be my slave and the rest of you shall be innocent. So he changes the bargain a little bit. He's like, well, no, I'm not going to kill them, but they'll be my slave. The rest of you can go. And he uses a very interesting word. The rest of you shall be innocent. This phrase mocks the guilt-ridden gang of ten. They're living in constant fear of punishment for the very uninnocent thing they did to Joseph 13 years ago the steward gives them the opportunity to feign innocence. But, but it will have to be, and here's the point, it would have to be at Benjamin's expense. The test has another layer added to it. Then they hurried. Each man lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. He searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And they tear their clothes. And when each man loaded his donkey, they returned to the city. They tear their clothes. They mourn. Their father is about to lose his other favorite son. The one thing he refused to let happen, 
Jacob kept saying again and again for three chapters, I refuse to send Benjamin. I will not send Benjamin, my only son. Remember the favoritism dripping in his statements. And the, the gang of ten is like, what about us, Dad? We're your sons too. No, he's the only son left of my wife. You had another wife too, but he's only talking about Rachel. He refused to let Benjamin go, lest harm befall him. He doesn't care what happens to the gang of ten brothers, but Benjamin, no harm can fall him. And here the brother, harm can befall him. And now the brothers see that he's about to become a slave. They tear their clothes. They tear their clothes. Benjamin has a death sentence. And Joseph has orchestrated all this to get to this moment. To get to this moment. Benjamin's head is on the chopping block. His brother, the other favorite, will his brothers betray and abandon Benjamin too, just like they did 13 years ago, or will they extend loyalty to Benjamin despite their jealousy? Despite their jealousy. In order for us to appreciate what is about to happen in the climax of the story, I need to circle back before we continue with verse 14. I need to circle back and discuss a theme in the plot that we have so far ignored in this series. And it's the question of who gets the birthright. Who gets the birthright? Remember, in the macro picture of the book of Genesis, you have God makes a promise of land, people, and blessing to Abraham, right? And this has been the center of the story since chapter 12, the, the holy people of God. God selects Abraham, Ab and your descendants are going to be a nation. It's gonna, you, you're going to be so many, it'll be like the, the, the number of stars or the number of sand in the sea, okay? So this is the beginning of the nation. And this has been at the center of the story of Genesis. And that covenant, that promise, was passed down via the birthright. So the question of the birthright is therefore also central. Who's going to get it? It went from Abraham to Isaac, not Ishmael. It went from Jacob, or it went from Isaac to Jacob, not Esau. And soon it'll be Jacob's turn to pass down the birthright. The norm was the firstborn. The firstborn son received pride of place in the family, more material inheritance, and in the case of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he also received the promise of God. It was passed down to him. Abraham was the steward of the promise, then Isaac, then Jacob. And to the original audience of the book of Genesis some millennia ago, they would not have missed this because this was their culture too. We don't have firstborn birthright stuff anymore. So it's kind of weird to us. But to them, they're, they're sitting there thinking, who's going to get it next? Who's going to get it next? So they and we are on the edge of our seats to see who's going to get that fatherly blessing, the patriarchal blessing. Who's going to pick up the mantle when Jacob dies and get the birthright? Will it be the firstborn, Reuben? Will it be someone else? Perhaps, some, perhaps someone unconventional? Remember, Esau should have gotten the birthright, not Jacob. But Jacob was the younger. And God seems to be upending things. And that's where the storytelling in Genesis gets so intentional. We get some tidbits along the way about the top contenders for the birthright. These tidbits may, have seem, may seem unrelated. If you just peruse Genesis and read through it, you're like, what is this story about Dinah in here for? And why is there a sentence about Reuben here? But they're central to the story. They're central to the story because of the birthright. And the first person who, who's up for grabs for the birthright is, you guessed it, Reuben, the firstborn. So, there's a, but there's a little tidbit at the end of chapter 35. It says, Reuben slept with his father's concubine and defiled his father's bed, which is as messed up as it sounds. So, Reuben gets nixed. Reuben is put on the naughty list, essentially. He's getting coal for Christmas, not the birthright. And it says in, uh, explicitly in, in 1 Chronicles 5, actually, that that's, that's precisely why he didn't get it. So Reuben's next. Ne next. And who's next? Reuben's next and who's next? Simeon and Levi. They're number two and number three. They're next for the birthright. And then we get a story about the two of them. Two brothers. It's not a coincidence that they're next in line for the birthright. Number two and number three. And it's the story of Dinah. They had a sister. Her name was Dinah. She was raped by a local Shechemite man. Uh, when they were pastoring near the city. And then the brothers are dishonored by this. Never mind what happened to Dinah, but it's a patriarchal culture. 
the brothers are dishonored by this. They say, you dishonored us, you dishonored our sister. But then this guy who raped Dinah said, no, I love her, I love her, I want to marry her. I want to marry her. And so he requests from Jacob to marry his daughter Dinah, but the brothers are furious, and so they scheme this little plan. They say, sure, you can marry our sister, but all your men have to be circumcised, you know, for religious reasons before you marry with our, before we can intermarry, you know, our people with your people. Um, but it's this big scheme, right? It's this big scheme. They wait three days when the men are in the most pain, and I've actually talked to somebody who had a circumcision as an adult when I was in Israel, and it sounds horrific. Um, <laughs> I won't go into details, uh, but really painful, okay? So they're in a lot of pain, the whole town, all the fighting men of the town, and then just two men, Simeon and Levi, kill all the men in the whole town, right? They kill all the men in the whole town. It was a ruse and w- because you raped my sister. And what is Jacob saying? You have, bought, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land. And my men, being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed. Now, everybody in Canaan thinks that I'm going to attack them, and now I have to be on the defense for the rest of my life. You guys are idiots. What were you thinking? So now Simeon and Levi are on the naughty list. They can't be trusted with the birthright and the blessing. They're reckless, treacherous, and deceitful. Simeon is next. Levi is next. So who is after Levi? Who's after Levi? Who's number four? It's Judah. It's Judah. And immediately after we read of the gang of ten brothers betraying Joseph in chapter 37, there's an episode about, guess who? Judah. There's a whole chapter about Judah. Chapter 38. We we skipped it for the continuity of the story, but we're circling back to it now because Judah is next in line for the birthright. Is he going to get next to and the story goes like this. Judah has three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. Shelah. And uh, I couldn't resist. And Er marries a woman named Tamar. It means date. He marries a woman named Tamar. It says, the text says, Er was evil in the sight of the Lord, so he killed him. Okay, there goes Er. It was the responsibility back then, if your brother died and was married, you had the responsibility of producing a child with his wife to carry on his name right? To carry on his name. So if you had a child, this all sounds so weird. I know, but it's what they did. Because, because everything was related to families and it was patriarchal families. You had to have a son, right? You had to have a son to carry on the name of his father. So essentially the brother would have a child with his late brother's wife and that child would be the heir of his brother's fortune, which means that for the guy who's doing it, he gets nothing. He doesn't get his brother's fortune. That son doesn't even count as his. All this stuff. That was Onan's job. Number two, Judah's second born. Onan knew the offspring would not be his, the text said, and so he doesn't do it. He doesn't, he doesn't produce an heir. He refuses, right? And then the Lord kills Onan because he said, this is your responsibility. You're supposed to do this. Onan dies. The next in line is Sheila. Sheila, third one. But at this point, Judah says, Tamar is a bad luck charm, right? He doesn't know what's happening. He's like, Tamar's a bad luck charm. Um, I'm gonna, I'll give you Sheila later after he grows up. Tamar's like, okay. But then Sheila grows up and guess what? Judah doesn't give him to him because he's like, I, I don't want this one to die too, right? So what happens? There's sheep shearing time. It's like Mardi Gras back then. It was a big festival, whatever. Lots of, lots of drinking wine, lots of eating, lots of sheep shearing, which was exciting. I've never done it before. Um, And then there's a prostitute on the road as Judah's walking home. Guess who it is? Tamar. She dresses up as a prostitute to fool Judah to get pregnant. We'll see why. It's so that when she is found out to be pregnant out of wedlock, she can essentially accuse Judah of not performing his role in giving giving her his son, Shelah to carry on the name, and be her insurance policy. Remember, they didn't have health insurance. They didn't have retirement. If she didn't have a son, she was going to be a widow, and there's a reason that the Bible keeps saying, take care of the widows. They have nothing. Okay? So that's what Judah was also withholding from her, a stable life. And so she gets pregnant. People people find out, and they're like, you are pregnant three months, and uh, and you're not married. 
And so Judah gets all angry, and he's like, well, we'll burn her, which was not even the prescribed punishment back then, okay? So Judah's freaking out. It's ridiculous. We'll burn her. And then, and then he says, who is the man who got you pregnant? And she says, the man, and she had taken Judah's stuff, okay? She'd taken a signet and a staff. And she said, the man to whom these belong, it's Judah's. It's Judah's. And he has two options at that point. He can be unforgiving and hard-hearted and kill her anyway. And then he'll be the next one nixed off the list for the birthright. Too morally reprehensible for a blessing to pass down to him as the other three brothers were. He could be unforgiving and hard-hearted or he could own up to the fact that it was him who had done her wrong in the first place by withholding his son, Sheila. How will he respond when he's backed into a corner? She, this is what Judah says. There's a pause in the story, and Judah says, she, this woman who played the prostitute, is more righteous than I am because I withheld my son from her. Judah has a radical change of heart in a chapter, a chapter after selling his brother. And we expected him to be nixed too, but there he is confessing his wrongdoing and righting a wrong that he had done. Back in chapter 43, Judah was the one who convinced Jacob to let Benjamin come with the gang of ten to Egypt. And do you remember what he said? I myself will be surety for the boy. And now, with Benjamin's life on the line, moving back to the Joseph story, with Benjamin's life on the line, guess who is about to step forward? It's Judah. Verse 14 in chapter 44. When Judah and his brothers, notice that, not when Reuben and his brothers, but Judah and his brothers, the narrator is drawing our attention to Judah. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell to the ground before him. Joseph sees this. Their clothes are torn, and Joseph knows why. He orchestrated the encounter. Their noses are in the dirt another time. And one of them is about to beg for the life of Benjamin, the representative of Joseph who begged for his life and was shown no mercy in chapter 37. They fell to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that such a man as I can find things out by divination? He's playing the part. Don't worry, he wasn't a pagan. He's playing the part and he's saying, I knew that one of you stole my cup. So Judah said, so Judah stands up and says, what can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? How can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. He's confessing. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. But Joseph says, far be it for me to do this. The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. But as for you, go in peace, Bashalom. Go in peace to your father. The brothers offer themselves as a group of 11. Joseph refuses because he needs to see them show loyalty to Benjamin as their brother. Trust was deeply broken between Joseph and his brothers. He needs something to show him that they can begin to restore that relationship. No, y'all are fine, just Benjamin. And he sets them up perfectly to abandon Benjamin to slavery just like they did to him. He's reenacting the selling of the youngest that happened to him. The test is familial loyalty. Will the gang of ten extend loyalty or will they abandon Benjamin too? Verse 18, then Judah approached him. So they're all on the ground, clothes torn. Judah stands up and walks to him to intercede and says, Oh, my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears. And before I continue, consider that this is the longest discourse, what we're about to read in the entire book of Genesis. What was important to the narrator is about to be right here. Oh, my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ear. And do not be angry with your servant, for you are equal to Pharaoh. He's using very deferential language because this guy could have him killed in an instant. 
Okay? My Lord asked his servants. It sounds wooden to us, but there's a reason he's speaking this way. He doesn't want to die. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? Joseph asked them that. And we said to my Lord, We have an old father and a little child of his old age. That's Benjamin. Remember, Joseph was trying to find out if they were okay. Now his brother is dead, Joseph, so he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. Imagine how hard it would be for Judah, less loved son of the less loved wife, to say that. He alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him, but not us. And he says this sticking up for Benjamin. Imagine what it took for Judah to say that. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. But we said, the lad cannot leave his father for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Again, we totally recognize the favoritism of Jacob and I'm willing to admit it. Jacob loves Benjamin and he would die if something happened to him. You, Joseph, said, however, to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. Joseph demands to see Benjamin. Thus it came about when we went up to your servant, my father, we said what you said. Our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But I'm like, we can't go, dad. If our youngest brother is with us, Benjamin, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. So Jude is giving us a recap of what happened in chapter 43. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. How many wives did he have? How many sons did he have? Two wives, 12 sons. But your servant, our father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. Again, imagine what it took for Judah to say that. And the one went out from me, and I said, surely he is torn to pieces. Remember, they made it look like he was killed by an animal. And I have not seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm befalls him, Benjamin, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow, which is where they used for the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up with the lad's life. So Judah's talking to Joseph again. If I go back to dad and, the, and, and Benjamin is not with us, his life is bound up in Benjamin's life. When he sees that he is not with us, he will die. Judah verbalizes the favoritism, but he's more concerned about his father than his own neglect. Thus, your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. For your servant, he's talking about himself, for I, I became surety for the lad to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, verse 33, please let your servant remain instead of the boy to save my father and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go to my father if Benjamin is not with me? For fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father. Judah offers his life in exchange for Benjamin's safety. He approaches Joseph. He walks up to him directly. I mean, this is the scene. And says, take me, not him. And he didn't just do this spur of the moment. But as Joseph learned, Judah planned this ahead of time. Should anything happen to Benjamin? For I became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Judah extends deep familial loyalty. Deep familial loyalty to Benjamin. Judah uses we more than ten times in his speech where there is no recognition of guilt, there is no reconciliation. And we saw in the tearing of their clothes for Benjamin and breathtakingly in Judah's speech the acknowledgement of wrongdoing by the gang of ten. We, 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 God found out the iniquity of your servants. They're admitting everything. They acknowledge their own treachery. And now instead of tearing Joseph's clothes as a pretext for murder, they tear their own on behalf of Benjamin. Instead of leaving Benjamin to slavery, Judah takes the lead and says, I will take his place. And Judah mentions his father 14 times. 14 times in this speech. His father who favored his other wife his other sons, Joseph and Benjamin, who cared much less 
about the welfare of the gang of ten brothers from Leah that Judah was a part of. Judah says, my father, my father, my father. What a radical transformation. The gang of ten is at least somewhat penitent, but Judah stands out as having experienced a most radical transformation. And there is no one in the book of Genesis, not even Joseph, who undergoes such a radical change. Judah is willing to give himself in exchange for a more loved brother of a more loved wife. His father cares less for him than Benjamin, yet for the sake of his father's well-being, he is willing to be enslaved for life. No one in Genesis undergoes such a radical transformation as Judah. And he is the one who extends the loyalty Joseph has been looking for. Have they changed? And then the text says, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. He wept so loudly that they heard it anyway. Previously, he has always turned aside to weep. He's wept like five times at this point in the story. He usually turns aside to weep and he cleans himself up. But now he finally goes, full disclosure, full exposure, full, it's me for the first time. He bursts into tears when Judah says, take me, not Benjamin. They had changed. And now begins the time where he can let his guard down slowly. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer answer him because they were dismayed at his presence. They are terrified. You can imagine. They thought he's been dead and he's been the one in front of them this whole time. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. For famine, for the famine has been in the land two years and there's still five more years to go where there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. This is the second time Joseph says, I am your brother whom you sold. And what does he do next? Does he blast them? Does he say, get a lawyer? No, he comforts them. It's incredible. It's incredible. Do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. Remember how guilty they felt in the last two chapters. Everything they did was governed by guilt and paranoia, but Joseph is doing something beautiful here. He's taking the reality of human pain and evil, as he'll call it in chapter 50, and he weaves it into a grander scheme of God's plan. Joseph maintains this entirely God-centered perspective, but he doesn't dismiss his pain at the same time in view of God's sovereignty. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Remember, this is the macro story. Joseph sees the big picture. The chosen family will be preserved because it's always been a question of Will they survive? Will God's promise be fulfilled or fall flat? God sent me here to keep you alive. It's the second time. Or, sorry, verse 8. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. It's the second time Joseph has said, God sent. So did God send or did the brothers sell? As it says in verse 4, you sold me, God sent me. There's a mystery there, and Joseph doesn't feel the need to explain it. Was it God or the brothers? Both realities are on the lips of Joseph. God is bigger than the pain he experienced, yet that pain is very real. You sold me, God sent me. He doesn't dismiss it with, well, God is sovereign, No, the two realities are set side by side. It's the same in chapter 50 when he says, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. There is no but in the text, even though there usually says but. There is no vav there. There is no 
but. It's you, you did this, God did this. Joseph sees the sovereign will of God, but not in a way that ignores the reality of human experience. And that's, that's significant as we proclaim a sovereign God. And there are theologies that are so strong on the sovereignty of God that everything is simply folded in and devalued, right, under this umbrella of sovereignty, but not for Joseph. You sold, God sent. <laughs> Hurry up and go to my father. Say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of Egypt. You shall live in the land of Goshen. Come down and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to go. Again, is it God sent me to deliver or I will provide for you? Or is it God will provide for you or I will provide for you? It's both in Joseph's mind. It's both in Joseph's mind. God sent me, I will provide. Behold your eyes, see the eyes of my brother Benjamin. See that this is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen. And you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept again. And Benjamin wept on his. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterward, his brothers talked with them. There's a ton that you can glean from this story. And it's difficult to, you can't talk about it all. You simply can't talk about it all. And there's two things that I wanted to, in conclusion, think about as we think about this story. And the first one is forgiveness versus reconciliation. Forgiveness is something that you can do without the offending party being there. You can forgive a wrongdoing and refuse to seek just recompense. You can refuse to seek justice. You can forgive for the wrong without someone being there. Joseph proves that. He didn't take vengeance on his brothers. No, instead he provided for them. But that doesn't mean that Joseph was willing to entrust himself and his identity to his brothers. Remember, we might have said, it's enough when they offered themselves as slaves as a group of 11. Remember, they said, take all of us as slaves. But Joseph said, no, I have to see if they'll extend loyalty to Benjamin before I can begin to entrust myself to them before I can consider being vulnerable with them again. They had betrayed a most fundamental relationship, the trust between brothers, and they had sold him. It was the basic question, have they changed? That's forgiveness. Now reconciliation ultimately takes both parties moving toward each other. And the story of Joseph is often hailed as a beautiful picture of reconciliation between him and his brothers, but that's an oversimplification. After Jacob dies in chapter 50, the gang of 10 still does not trust Joseph, even though he, the one abused, the one sold, the one forgotten, he had been vulnerable and entrusted himself and his identity to them. He had provided for them, but they still fabricate a letter after Jacob dies, and they say, Jacob, your father... Jacob, your father um, has requested that you forgive them and that you don't take any harm, you don't do any harm to, to your brothers and all this stuff. And do you know what Joseph's response is? He weeps again. They don't get it. They don't get it. They don't understand what was happening. They don't see what God was doing. They don't see what I was doing, forgiving them, seeking reconciliation with his brothers. He wept for them on several occasions that's something they never do for him, except for Benjamin. Benjamin weeps on his brother's neck. The rest are scared for the rest of their lives. They are still overridden by that guilt. They're still overridden by that guilt. And the second thing, so thinking about reconciliation versus forgiveness, I think is significant. Reconciliation is both parties moving toward each other. The brothers never do that. The brothers never do that. And the second thing is transformation and redemption. And that's in the story 
of Judah. And ironically, I have lost a page of my manuscript, so I'm going to have to make this up. Not make it up, but wing it, you know? Um, Judah goes from, I'm going to marry who I want, Canaanite woman, screw you guys, I'm withholding my son, to I am the one, or she is more righteous than I, you know, she is more righteous than I, speaking of his daughter Tamar, to I will be a slave in the place of Benjamin, his brother. And this discourse, again, is the longest discourse in Genesis. So what was important to the narrator? It's like God is pointing at Judah, saying like, this is what I care about. This is the one I want you to notice. Pay attention. I I didn't pick perfect people. I'm not interested in perfect people. His choice of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is obvious enough of all the dysfunction in their family that we've read about as we talked about Abraham, as we talked about Jacob and looked at Jacob's life. It's sketchy. Jacob was a sketch character. He really was, right? But but God was not interested in Jacob being perfect. He was interested in the transformation. And he...